Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maxim Joseph. Welcome to the Richard Warnicke Memorial Community Forum. Um, and the theme for this forum is Cancer Health and Mental Wellness for you, your family, and your community. Uh, and so we have a couple um, Zoom housekeeping details to go over just to make your experience with this Zoom meeting as accessible for you as possible. So we have the blue arrows at the bottom that shows the chat feature. Um, that's where you can, you know, leave your comments and questions. I guess no, not questions, but just comments on um, any information that you're receiving. Uh, if you feel like it's inspiring or whatever, you can leave those in the chat. Um, you can also have the yellow arrow to raise your hand um, to ask any questions that you have. And the red arrow shows you the Q&A section. That is where you're going to be putting any questions that you have instead of the chat. So the team knows specifically that this is a question that someone has and they can get it answered as soon as possible. Now, I know we have a session today that's in the main room that's going to be run um, primarily in Spanish. And so today, this interpretation section might be a hot cake for everyone because um, if you don't speak Spanish, you have English and Cantonese um, options available for you. So during that session, make sure that you're in the appropriate room so you can be able to listen in and be able to get the information that is being given out. And I think the team is also going to leave a reminder in the chat uh, when we get to that session. Also, I just wanted to remind everyone that you're going to be muted upon entering this event because this is a forum for us to listen in on the information that has been presented by professionals. Um, and so if you have any questions, please raise your hand or post a question in the Q&A box and it will be answered as soon as possible. Also, this event is being digitally recorded, um, but I also wanted to take this time to give a quick reminder that sometimes reviewing information on cancer health and um, can, in reviewing information on cancer health can trigger traumatic reactions, um, either from your personal experience or from the experience of someone that you know or from a loved one. So if you feel like you need to, please leave and take a break whenever you need to. This event will be recorded, so um, you will be able to review this information at a later date, um, and it will be available on our website. Once again, my name is Maxine Joseph. I'm a research assistant at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, and I have the honor of being a 2020 Chicago Tech Fellow. And for our welcome remarks, I'd like to in, I'd like to invite our steering committee co-chairs, Ms. Henriette, Ms. Henrietta Barcelo and Ms. Joanne Glenn. So you have the floor, Ms. Henrietta. Ms. Henrietta, good morning. Good morning. Um uh, uh, saludos and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, we are glad that you're here to join us on this uh, wonderful beautiful morning. I love the autumn. Uh, it's all about uh, this opportunity at the uh, Robert Wernicke Memorial uh, Community Forum to talk about, and appropriately so, about cancer, about you, family, and community. For if you're not healthy and you don't have information, who's going to take care of us? Who's going to take care of our family? Right. And so there is where I finally come into. Also, you are a store of information to uh, share with community, friends, uh, loved ones. It is so important. So it's all about you being healthy and taking the necessary screenings that we have to take to remain healthy so that we can remain and be agents of change along with our academic you know, partners here at UIC, NEIU and Northwestern, right? So if we don't have a voice, if we do not participate in these actions and this call to action, then we won't have a voice. So each of us are charged to be agents of change, to share this information. So today I ask you as an agent of change is for you to take this information. And if you don't understand it, or if you need a little more clarification, please reach out to us. 
check is here. You can go online uh, and or talk to your uh, community representatives and ask them about this to reach out, right? Number two, I want you to um, share this information with your neighbors, with your family. And I want you to invite us to your house. Uh, we'd love to come to hear and talk one-on-one. -on -one. Doesn't have to be a big group, but we just want to be able to do this, right? So remain engaged, be your community voice and be agents of change when it comes to cancer health and the stresses that it puts on us. So I'd like to say thank you. Also, last but not least, I'd like to thank the Community Steering Committee of CHAC for all their input, particularly our Community um, Program Committee uh, of um, Rosemary Rogers, Maganette, uh, Mergesha, uh, Judy Guitelman, uh, Ju uh, Judy Amy Wong, Dolores Castaneda, Candace Henley, Patricia Canessa, Sue Merlos, Joanne Glenn, um, for keeping and for keeping us all together, keeping all these bricks, the glue that puts us all together, Alicia from NEIU, Melissa from UIC, and Araceli from Northwestern. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna pass you on to my sister here, uh, Joanne Glenn. Good morning and happy Friday. And as Henrietta said, Yes, we're a sister from another mother. <laughs> it's been six years that we've served as the co-chairs for CHAMP. 2016 today, we're not going anywhere, just shifting to another position. It's been a pleasure, quite a journey, a lot of tears, a lot of happiness, and a lot of learn as we reach out for the community. The word I like to leave you with today is trust. T-R-U-S-T. Google says that does not know everything. Trust is a firm belief in the real, real ability, truth, ability, or strength of something or someone. So we should all trust someone. I'm gonna use trust with a different spin on it. I want T to be trust, of course. Is there somebody you trust? There's gotta be someone you trust. You trust your provider? You trust your loved ones? Do you trust a stranger? Reliability. Trust. You, are you trusting someone to do a clinical trial? Are you trusting someone for advice? Are you trusting someone for knowledge? Who do you trust? You cannot assume, as one should not assume, assumptions are not the same for everybody. So I am empowering you to make sure you trust the system, trust the resources, trust the outreach, and those that are around you so your outcomes are better. We're all living for a healthier tomorrow. Part of the journey of winning is trust. So I'm gonna challenge you to trust the person you believe in, your provider, your caregivers, your neighbor and your resources. Reach out and trust someone to make a difference in your healthcare. As Henrietta said, I'd like to thank everyone in check for these wonderful hard earned six years, starting with a napkin, <laughs> moving on to the pillar of success. It's been a great journey. Um, and, and so, so well attended. And we'll move on. Have a great day today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Henrietta and Joanne, for that very warm welcome. Uh, what a great way to start out this session. Um, I'm going to be introducing our next, our next session. Um, this session is going to be a cancer survival panel. Again, like I mentioned earlier, this is going to be the session that is going to be primarily in Spanish. And so um, I'd like to introduce Ms. Judy Gitterman and Ms. Jeanette Gonzalez. They're going to be leading this session. And again, make sure that you're using the interpret function on Zoom to be in the proper language session so you can be able to the Thank you so much, everyone. And welcome, Ms. Gitterman. Gracias a todos por sus palabras. Eh, eh, los que no saben español, si quieren practicar un poquito su español el día de hoy, está bien con todas nosotras. Pero eh, hoy quiero agradecer a Chicago Check por tener un panel, por, eh, tener un panel de mujeres extraordinarias sobrevivientes de cáncer 
a, a algunas son sobrevivientes de cáncer de mama, tenemos a, a Sashay que es sobreviviente de cáncer cervical. Es un placer para nosotros eh, poder contar con este panel de maravillosas mujeres con las cuales van a, eh, cada una de ellas va a compartir un poquito la historia de sobrevivencia de cada una. Um, mi nombre es Judy Gittelman, eh, eh, yo soy sobreviviente de cáncer de mama también dos, do, en dos oportunidades y represento la organización ALAS, que es una organización, organización sin fines de lucro que trabaja y ayuda con mujeres sobrevivientes de cáncer de mama en eh, Chicago. Uh, pero no quiero eh, empezar a hablar sin nombrar a mi colega y amiga eh, Janet Santana, o Janet González, que está hoy presente con nosotros, eh, y le voy a dar la palabra a ella, y entre Janet y yo vamos a cofacilitar esta charla de sobrevivientes. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Como dijo Yuri, mi nombre es Janet Santana González. Y just for the English speaking audience, I think I'll say a few words in English. I've had the honor and pleasure of working alongside um, Alas Wings, an organization that offers support to Latina women with breast cancer. They have been an amazing partner um, to the University of Illinois Cancer Center. And when we talk about breast cancer, many times we start to lose that human element. Um, we start getting lost in statistics, um, talking of um, get lost in the research, but we forget to hear the stories, right? That help us put a name and a face um, to breast cancer that impacts so many millions of women and, and some men. And so, nos sentimos muy conmovidos y agradecidos de tener el honor de escuchar las historias de estas cinco mujeres. Um, y aunque el cáncer le, le puede arrebatar muchas cosas, um, a la vez le ha dado muchas otras cosas, como ustedes van a escuchar en sus historias, le ha dado a muchas de nuestras mujeres fortaleza, fe y la habilidad de valorar las cosas que antes uno no le daba valor. Y con eso quiero, quiero pasar a presentar a una de nuestras sobrevivientes, um, Liliana. Liliana, adelante. Muchas gracias. Gracias por tenerme aquí. Eh, buenos días, mi nombre es Liliana Glasgow. Soy sobreviviente de cáncer desde hace 13 años. En el año 2008, me detecté un pequeño absceso en mi seno izquierdo. Inmediatamente hice una cita con mi ginecóloga. Ella me revisó y me dijo que debido a mi edad, en ese tiempo yo tenía 39 años. Eso era normal. Los conductos lácteos se van calcificando y eso era lo que a mí me pasaba, que era algo sin ningún riesgo, que no era peligroso. Sin embargo, yo no me quedé tranquila. Hice otra cita con ella para junio, hice otra cita para ella en noviembre y finalmente en diciembre. En cada ocasión ella me revisó, en cada ocasión ella me trató de tranquilizar y en diciembre finalmente yo fui la que le dijo, doctora, esto está creciendo. Yo vi cómo el rostro de ella cambió, cómo su expresión cambió. Y lo que me dijo fue, voy a conseguirte una cita para que tengas tu mamograma. La cita más próxima que ella pudo conseguir fue para el día febrero 27 del 2009, un día después de mi cumpleaños. Para, para entonces yo cumplí 40 años, que de todas maneras ya me tocaba. Estuve en el hospital, en el Northwestern Memorial Hospital, desde las 9 de la mañana, 9 y media, y me dejaron salir pasada las 5 de la tarde. Me tomaron 6 mamogramas de mi seno derecho, más de 20 del seno izquierdo, me hicieron dos ultrasonidos, me hicieron biopsia y finalmente me pude ir a mi casa. Eso fue un viernes. Para el día lunes a las 10 de la mañana, alguien estaba en el teléfono llamándome para decirme, señora, usted tiene cáncer. Me dieron unos números telefónicos para empezar con mi tratamiento y decirte, me, me quedé impactada por la noticia, es decir, poco, estuve llorando, por supuesto. Afortunadamente, mi marido estaba manejando el carro porque estábamos en el carro los dos, si no, igual y no lo cuento. Eh, para el día 3 de abril yo tuve mi cirugía, me hicieron una lumpectomía, pudieron salvar mi seno. Sin embargo, eh, cuando revisaron mis nódulos linfáticos, descubrieron que yo que ya había pasado el cáncer a uno de ellos y tuvieron que quitarme una cadena de 24 de abajo de la axila, por lo que me dejaron con mala circulación del brazo izquierdo y después esto resultó en linfidema, una condición con la que he estado lidiando toda, todo este tiempo y que voy a seguir lidiando con ella 
toda mi vida. Después siguió un tratamiento de ocho sesiones de quimioterapia, 35 radiaciones y tratamiento con pastillas desde entonces, que tienes que tomar una pastillita para las hormonas. Según mi doctora, mis, uh, mis achaques, todo lo que me pasó durante el cáncer no fue grave. Eh, siempre he sido una persona muy sana, sin embargo, pues lo que para ella no era grave para mí era así como que se me acaba el mundo porque cositas de intestinales, eh, los dolores de los pies, los dolores de las manos, dolores de cabeza, el cambio de quedarte sin cabello, el color de, de piel que te cambia. Fueron, fueron muchos cambios, fueron muchas cosas que estuve viviendo durante ese, duró todo un año, todo el 2009 estuve en este tratamiento. Afortunadamente salí bien de esto. Infortunadamente cosas que a mí me, me resultaron un poquito más difíciles de superar fue un cansancio crónico y depresión. La depresión es un monstruo que, que te ataca. Los químicos que te dan afectan a la química de tu cerebro y en mi caso a mí me dio depresión. Todo me hace llorar. Por lo que en mi experiencia me gustaría aconsejar tres cosas para las personas que están pasando por el cáncer, que están diagnosticadas o que ya tienen su tratamiento. Uno, confíen en su network, rodense de la gente que aman y que las ama. Eso les va a servir mucho para que ustedes salgan adelante. Dos, acérquense a asociaciones como Grupo Alas, como la Asociación Americana del Cáncer, como Grupo Immerman, como Gilda's Club. Todo ese tipo de asociaciones hay gente que ya está pasando o que ya pasó por este proceso de cáncer y que las van a ayudar, las van a estender, las van a escuchar. Infortunadamente nuestro grupo de amigas, que en mi caso a mí me, me apoyaron muchísimo, llegó un momento en el que ellos ya no me entendieron lo que yo estaba viviendo. Pero cuando me acerqué a estas asociaciones, encontré gente que ya había pasado por ello y que me pudieron ayudar. Y mi, mi último punto es que tenemos que convertirnos en, en abogados defensores de nuestra salud. Tenemos que escucharnos, tenemos que usar nuestra intuición. Si algo está en tu cuerpo y tú crees que, no es, que está mal, créeme, a lo mejor está mal. Lo más seguro es que esté mal. Habla con tus doctores, forma un buen equipo con todo tu grupo de salud y sigue adelante. La vida continúa, la vida sigue. ¿Ha habido cambios en mi vida? Sí pero muchos de ellos han sido positivos y seguimos adelante. Muchísimas gracias por su atención. Muchísimas gracias por haberme escuchado. Hasta luego. Gracias Liliana. Déjame ver si tengo el micrófono puesto. Sí, gracias. Muchísimas gracias Liliana por, por haber contado tu historia y eh, por seguir adelante, por seguir viniendo a los grupos de apoyo, por eh, abogar por, por ti misma y por otras mujeres que están empezando quizá a pasar por este, esta trayectoria. Así que muchísimas gracias. No manejes mientras estás hablando. Y la per segunda persona que tenemos, voy a presentar a Berta Mariscal. Um, Berta, uh, no sé cómo describir a Berta, además de ser sobreviviente. <risa> Berta la conoce mucha gente, no solamente en Alas, en Gildas Club, en Immerman Angels, en todas las organizaciones que abogan para seguir adelante y para ayudar a otras sobrevivientes, Berta es, es esa persona conocida por todo el mundo. Así que, Berta, es un placer y un honor tenerte con nosotros, un placer y un honor que puedas compartir tu historia de sobrevivencia con, con el grupo el día de hoy. Todas tuyas. <risa> Buenos días, gracias. Este, ay, gracias por ese halago. <risa> ah, bueno, mi nombre es Berta Mariscal. Ah, soy sobreviviente ya 18 años. Ah, ah, mi diagnóstico fue cuando yo tenía 40 años. Desde entonces este, me he dado la tarea a, a luchar más por mi vida, ¿verdad? Porque, digo, como latinas le tenemos miedo a la palabra cáncer. Pero realmente en este tiempo, esa, esa es una palabra que, que le tenemos miedo, pero porque no conocemos nada sobre ella. Entonces, ah, cuando me dieron el diagnóstico, ah, traté de, de informarme y buscar junto con mi hijo información y, y ver qué era lo que es, por qué es y para qué es. Entonces, lo que hice fue hablar con mi médico 
y lo primero que me, mandó a, me mandaron a hacer fue una biopsia. Es una pequeña cirugía donde cortan el pequeño tumor, me lo quitaron. Al, al, man, al mandarlo a diagnosticar, me dijeron que sí, que realmente ya era cáncer. Lo tenía en etapa 3. Entonces, yo lo único que le, le dije al doctor, ¿qué es lo que sigue? ¿Qué tengo que hacer? ¿Y qué, qué me, en qué me, van a, qué me van a hacer? Entonces, sus palabras fue, como es etapa 3, va a ser un diagnóstico, es un diagnóstico un poquito alto. Le vamos a hacer todos los tratamientos que hay, que es quimioterapia, radiación y cirugía. Entonces, perfecto, empezamos con las quimioterapias al lado que al, al tiempo de que iban a ser seis quimioterapias, a fin de cuentas fueron cinco nada más. Enseguida me dijo, no vamos a hacer radiación, primero la, la cirugía. Hicieron la mastectomía, que es quitarme todo el seno y parte de la axila. Ah, al quitarme parte de la axila, como ahí están los ganglios donde drena el líquido linfático del brazo, tuve problemas después de, de la cirugía. Pero era, eso es lo menos, ¿verdad? Porque digo, lo más importante era erradicar el, el cáncer. Entonces pasó, seguimos este, con las radiaciones. Fueron 35 radiaciones de lunes a viernes. Fueron seis semanas, un poco cansadas porque es ir y venir diario, que es lo más pesado, ir y venir. En cambio, las quimios, como es un tipo de suero que va inyectado, pues te quedas sentada hasta que te lo ponen, sales y te vas. Las radiaciones no, las radiaciones vas diario. Entonces, ¿cuál es mi punto de que las, radi las radiaciones me cansaban mucho porque mis retos fueron el transporte público, porque todo esto fue en México, yo estaba en México, y, y ir y venir era un gran desafío en los transportes públicos. Entonces, eso fue mis desafíos, mis retos era llegar, y llegar, a, llegar al hospital y llegar a mi casa, realmente, y poder buscar y, y em, empezar a, a informarme y le preguntaba a los médicos, a los enfermeros, porque realmente en México no encontré ningún, ningún este, información. Todo lo hacía mi hijo por internet, él aquí en Estados Unidos, yo en México, y así andamos buscando información. Cuando terminé yo mis tratamientos después de dos años, de ser sobreviviente, haber terminado, a, seguí lidiando con mi linfedema, que es la inflamación del brazo, por falta de los ganglios que me quitaron. Entonces lo que hice fue, me dijo mi hijo que me viniera para acá a Estados Unidos, me vine con él, con mis hijos, porque los tres estaban aquí. Entonces empecé a buscar uh, asociaciones, uh, empecé a, a ver qué información, qué beneficios y qué podían apoyar. Empecé a investigar per, para mí personalmente, después fui, fui siendo voluntaria Empecé a llevar toda esa información a las personas. A los... Antes estaban las ferias de salud, iba mucho a las ferias de salud a llevar esa información para las demás. Porque dije, yo no lo tuve. Y si en este país es, es, es posible llevarla, hay que llevarla. Entonces, por eso me di a la tarea de, de llevar toda esta información no solamente de cáncer de seno, de, de todo tipo de cáncer. Entonces me uní a los grupos, segui, sigo siendo voluntaria de varias asociaciones y sigo llevando la información. A, a veces me hablan, a veces me mandan de los hospitales personas y así estoy. La cuestión es de que hay que aprender de lo malo, hay que sacarle lo bueno. Esta información me sirvió para ver lo fuerte que son. Como mujeres siempre luchamos por la familia, siempre luchamos por que todos estén bien, pero nunca tenemos tiempo para luchar por nosotras. Entonces, ah, mi consejo para las personas es, si quieres ver a tu familia bien, cuídate primero tú, para que todo tu entorno esté bien. 
um, que he aprendido. He aprendido a ser fuerte. He aprendido a luchar. He aprendido a ayudar. Y mi consejo para las personas nuevas, no tengan miedo a las palabras. Las palabras, como dicen, se las lleva el viento. Uh, hay que luchar. Hay que estar bien. En este tiempo, la palabra cáncer no es diagnóstico de muerte. Para mí, el cáncer, la palabra cáncer, es diagnóstico de fortaleza porque nos hace luchar y sacar esa fuerza donde no sabíamos que la teníamos. Sean fuertes para que su entorno sea fuerte. Eso es todo. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Berta. Pues yo conozco personalmente a Berta y me siento muy conmovida, no tan solo con las palabras de Liliana y ahora con las de Berta. Um, yo sé que el camino que ella ha tenido que atravesar no ha sido fácil y pueden oír que mi voz está temblando porque um, me conmoví mucho con su historia um, y, de, y de queremos dar las gracias um, por tu compromiso de apoyar y abogar para todas las mujeres que están impactadas por el cáncer. Berta, creo que muchas personas que están presentes aquí te conocen y saben que tu compromiso es genuino um, y te comprometes de todo corazón. Um, so muchas gracias por compartir tu historia. Y ahora nuestra próxima sobreviviente que queremos presentar es uh, Oralia Martínez. Oralia Martínez también um, es otra de nuestras mujeres um, que aboga por las demás. Um, toda eso es otra sobreviviente que fue diagnosticada a bastante temprana edad, a los 41 años, y queremos que ella comparte su historia. Adelante, Oralia. Sí, buenos días. Gracias, Janet. Uh, mi nombre es Oralia Martínez y yo fui diagnosticada con cáncer de mama, que se llama cáncer in situ. Uh, es este primera etapa, etapa cero, en el año 2018. Tenía 41 años. Uh, pues yo empecé con mucha comezón en mi seno izquierdo y yo decía, pues, ¿qué pasa? Comentaba con mis amigas y me decían, pues, son tus hormonas locas que ya estás en los 40 y, y pues ya. Y, pero esa comezón no, no cesaba, al contrario, era más frecuente y más frecuente. Y pues llamé a, al doctor para ver si me podía dar una orden. A mí me habían hecho mi mamograma un pues quiero decir un año antes, pero todavía no se cumplía el año. Más o menos mis síntomas empezaron en agosto y hasta diciembre me tocaba el siguiente mamograma. Y todo estaba bien, incluso me dijeron regresa en dos años, no tienes récord familiar, puedes regresar en dos años. Eh, llamé al doctor para ver si me podía dar una orden y hacerme un mamograma porque mi físico era hasta diciembre. Entonces me dijo a la enfermera, no, no se puede hasta que venga su físico, pero esa comezón no cesaba. Entonces yo llamé al hospital donde me hicieron mi primer mamograma y la que me atendió me dijo, ah, no, tú te vienes, tú tienes un síntoma y tú tienes que venir a hacerte tu mamograma. Yo me encargo de conseguir la orden con el doctor, no te preocupes y tú haz una cita para el mamograma. Entonces, en cuanto pude, hice mi cita para el mamograma y todo comenzó ahí. Um, primero pensaban que eran calcificaciones, me hicieron más ultrasonidos, a más mamogramas, una biopsia, después pues la biopsia quirúrgica donde ahí pues la, la cirujana me, me extrajo tres pequeños tumores y pues no estaban muy seguros, estaba yo entre la línea en medio que, que sí era cáncer o que no. La uh, doctora mandó los análisis a otro laboratorio para una segunda opinión y resultó ya ahí que sí era, era cáncer. Uh, pues fue un reto muy, muy difícil porque estaba trabajando mis niños, ¿verdad? Darle la noticia a, a la familia fue algo difícil. Todos nos asustamos con la palabra cáncer y pues para mi familia no fue la, la excepción. Entonces, mis niños, pues para mí estaban pequeños, ¿no? Mi niño 10 años, mi niña 12 años, pero pues son mis hijos. Mi esposo estaba muy aterrado también. Y 
un gran reto, ser fuerte para ellos, <ríe> ser fuerte cuando uno está atravesando con algo así que, que la asusta, ¿no? La palabra cáncer me, me asustó mucho. Um, soy la primera en la familia, me hicieron el examen donde uh, investigan si es algo genético, el mío salió negativo y que yo sepa también no, 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 hay, no hay nadie en, en la familia. Entonces fue como más, más sorpresivo. Yo pensé, cuando me hacían estudios, yo dije, no va a salir nada, <risa> no va a salir nada. Y siempre con la fe en alto, pidiendo a Dios que no fuera nada, pero bueno, me tocó. Eh, me sentí desubicada, no sabía qué hacer. Un gran reto para mí fue el idioma. Los doctores con los que yo iba únicamente hablaban y inglés y aunque a veces usaban un intérprete, no es lo mismo. Ese fue un, un, un gran reto. La doctora, la oncóloga que me atendió, me mandó con el programa de apoyo de Wellness House, que igual solamente hablan inglés, pero gracias a, a Dios que Alas me contactó. Fue un, una gran sorpresa para mí. Fue como un regalo que Dios me mandó que alas con todo el, el idioma totalmente en español, pues me contactaron. Yo dije, wow, yo sin pedir la ayuda, sin andarla buscando, ¿verdad? Me conformé con estar yendo a este grupo donde solo hablaba en inglés y que estaba recibiendo información y que sí me estaba ayudando, por supuesto. Pero siempre me sentía incómoda porque no entendía totalmente todo. Y gracias a alas uh, pude encontrar pues el mismo apoyo y ya en mi idioma y pues ya pude salir de muchas dudas. Eso me dio mucha confianza. Mi tratamiento fueron 20 sesiones de quimioterapia y pues fue pesado ir a, a las quimioterapias en la mañanita y alistar a los niños a la escuela, toda la rutina, irme a las quimioterapias y después irme a trabajar. Fue, fue muy difícil, ¿no? Seguir con, con, con todo eso, pero gracias a Dios que me dio esa fortaleza y gracias a los amigos y todo el apoyo que yo encontré aquí en Alas, uh, pude salir adelante. Um, eh, pues lo que yo he aprendido con esta enfermedad del cáncer es a darme cuenta que soy una persona valiente o, o que... He aprendido a ser una persona valiente. Por supuesto que un diagnóstico da, da miedo, pero eh, me he dado cuenta que podemos salir adelante, que si buscamos apoyo podemos encontrarlo y que no hay tanto que preocuparse, sino ocuparse, ocuparse en buscar información, que si un medicamento me está haciendo esta reacción, vamos a ocuparnos en informarnos y estos grupos de apoyo pues nos dan todas esas herramientas para salir adelante y que eso nos da mucha confianza y más fortaleza. Y pues gracias, quiero solamente agradecer a Alas por todo el, el apoyo recibido y un mensajito para quien esté pasando por un um, diagnóstico de, de cáncer. Sé que le va a dar miedo y no importa la etapa que, a que sea diagnosticada. Siempre tenemos que luchar hasta el final. Dios es el que tiene la última palabra. Y adelante, no, no dejar de, de luchar. Gracias. Gracias, Oralia, por siempre tener una palabra de aliento, siempre tener una palabra de amor y de, um, y de apoyo y de ayuda, ¿no? Eh, cosas que escribí, dijiste, hay que ser fuerte para ellos, estabas hablando de tus hijos, y creo que además la fortaleza, cuando uno tiene un diagnóstico de cáncer, hay que ser fuerte para los, la familia y tenemos que ser fuerte para nosotros mismos para se, poder seguir adelante, ¿no? Um, y dijiste, hablaste también del idioma, y quiero agradecer a Chicago Check hoy, por haber permitido, eh, y algunas de las personas que están acá presentes, por haber permitido que, este, que este, eh, este panel fuera en español, porque para poder contar nuestras historias y nuestros testimonios, eh, era importante poder hacerlo en nuestro propio idioma. Eh, voy a presentar ahora, ustedes van a pensar que la próxima eh, persona que va a hablar no habla español, pero no se confundan, habla español y habla muy bien español, muy buen, tiene muy buen español, es Sashay Jasper. Um, Sashay es nueva entre nosotras 
Eh, el cáncer de Isashai fue un cáncer cervical, pero no me voy a detener en hablar yo porque quiero que la escuchen eh, acerca de tu, su trayectoria con el cáncer. Eh, quiero solamente recordarle a los panelistas que tienen eh, entre 7 y 8 minutos solamente porque quisiéramos abrir los micrófonos al final o a, por si hay preguntas para poder responder. Sasha, y todas tuyas, mi amor. Muchas gracias, Yuri. ¿Sí me escuchan? Muy bien. Hola, mi nombre es Sasha Álvarez Jasper, como les dijo Yuri. Vivo en Chicago, pero orgullosamente soy de padres latinos. Mi mamá es hondureña, so soy catracha, y mi papá eh, que murió, que en paz descanse, era de Puerto Rico. So también soy boricua, para que tú lo sepas. <risa> tengo 38 años. Uh, gracias a Dios, tengo casi siete años de ser sobreviviente del cáncer cervical, como les contó Julie. Fui diagnosticada agosto del 2015 a los 31 años. Y el hospital donde me trataron fue en el Northwestern. Mi, mi diagnóstico fue en la última fase de la etapa, de la primera etapa. Gracias, Janet, por ayudarme con eso. Este, mi tratamiento incluyó seis semanas de quimioterapia intravenosa, so por las venas, y también simultáneamente, so a la misma vez, también tuve radiación. Tuve 35 sesiones de radiación interna y externa. Aunque hubieron muchos retos, mi mayor reto fue no poder estar con mi hija, que en ese entonces tenía cuatro años, uh, por el tratamiento y las medicaciones. So, por ejemplo, no podía yo abrazarla cuando venía de, la, 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 de tener radiación, no podía dormir con ella, no podía estar cerca de ella, por, uh, porque no, está, no es bueno para los niños estar uh, cerca de uno. So, eso fue muy difícil para mí, no poder hacer uh, las cosas que yo estaba acostumbrada a hacer con ella. Y en ese entonces ella estaba empezando la escuela, so ella quería estar eh, chineada conmigo, así, decimos chinear en, en Honduras, pero así, que yo la cargara, que la aguantara, la mamantara, no, yo no podía hacer esas cosas eh, durante esos meses de tratamiento específicamente. <coughs> El cáncer cervical me enseñó a confiar en Dios y en mí misma. También aprendí a pedir ayuda, que es muy difícil. Yo creo que para todas las mujeres, um, seamos latinas o no, es difícil pedir ayuda um, porque queremos hacerlo todo, pero no estamos para hacerlo todo y debemos de um, aprender que ese es nuestro poder, no tener que hacerlo todo. También me acordé que no estoy sola. Tengo amistades, tengo familiares y también tengo organizaciones como ALAS. Uh, no voy a mentir, en ese entonces yo no uh, sabía de la organización ALAS. Um, si yo hubiera tenido un apoyo como estas fabulosas mujeres, yo creo que sería, hubiera sido uh, para mí uh, muy impactante y me hubiera ayudado. Uh, pero sí lo que voy a decir es que... Um, hay bastante ayuda y recursos y uno lo que tiene que hacer es pedir la ayuda, como han dicho la, las otras panelistas. Pedir, confiar, creo que cuando empezamos esta charla, habló la señora Joanne de, de tener confianza en el sistema, en los, los recursos, en, en la ayuda que hay. Mi mensaje para todas nosotras, porque este mensaje también es para mí, es que tengamos confianza en nosotras mismas. Hablemos con nuestras familias frecuentemente y nuestras amistades de todo, porque no debemos de tener pena ni vergüenza de nuestra salud ni de lo que está pasando o sucediendo en nuestras vidas, porque nuestras, nuestros familiares y las amistades sí les importa nuestro bienestar. Y también busquemos ayuda espiritual, terapia y enfrentemos el cáncer juntas. No estamos solas. 
Ese es mi mensaje. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Sashay, por esas palabras. Cada historia que oigo, más sentimental me pongo. Um, ayer, en, ayer en este foro um, oí los, las historias de unos hombres maravillosos, cuidadores de, um, que eran los cuidadores, mayormente hijos, de mujeres que han tenido cáncer de mama. Y hoy al escuchar a ustedes, de verdad, yo creo que puedo hablar... Um, Puedo hablar de parte de la Universidad de Illinois y el Centro de Cáncer, también las otras universidades y todas las organizaciones que están aquí, que el foro, que oí los testimonios de ayer, más los de hoy, de verdad que fortalece el compromiso que tenemos nosotros um, de hacer este trabajo que hacemos, ¿verdad? Um, en apoyar a las personas que están impactadas por cáncer. Um, y pues muchas gracias por compartir sus historias y tenemos... Una historia más um, para escuchar. Tenemos a una sobreviviente recién diagnosticada, um, Petra Cisneros, y adelante, Petra. Hola, uh, mi nombre es Petra Cisneros. Soy sobreviviente de cáncer um, desde el, el año pasado, en el 2020, 2021. Eh, todo esto empezó... Um, por un mamograma anual, yo no sentía nada, no, no tenía ningún, ningún achaque de nada. Yo fui solamente por mi, mi regular um, mamograma. De ahí me salió que algo estaba normal. Me volvieron a mandar a otro mamograma, me hicieron un ultrasonido y me hicieron biopsia. Eh, enseguida me habló mi doctor. Y me dijo que tristemente habían recibido ya las, la, los resultados de la biopsia y había salido positiva a cáncer. Cuando el doctor me dijo, para mí fue, me quedé en shock. No lo podía creer porque yo siempre estaba al corriente, yo no sentía nada. Para mí era sentir como la muerte cerca. Lloré, me sequé mis lágrimas. Y el, lo siguiente era decirle a mi familia, fue muy duro y empezar otra vez, el, y empezar el proceso. Eh, me, detect, me detectaron el cáncer a los 45 años. Es, fui, a, me mandaron a hacerme quimioterapias, tuve 20 quimioterapias. Las cuatro primeras fueron dobles, las otras uh, me cambiaron el um, tratamiento, pero en total fueron 20. Después de las quimioterapias tuve una cirugía, tuve mastectomía doble, me quitaron dos ganglios y enseguida tuve 25 radiaciones que acabo de terminar el el miércoles pasado. Sigo en el proceso. Estoy empezando, voy a empezar la siguiente semana mis pastillas. Y pues mi cáncer fue cáncer en etapa 2, positivo estrógeno e invasivo ductual. Y yo resulté positiva a cáncer genético. Por esta razón, mi proceso es más largo. Aún me quedan otras dos cirugías, pero yo sé que con la ayuda de Dios las voy a lograr y voy a estar bien. Mi, mi proceso fue difícil porque yo no era uh, muy... No me gustaba que nadie me ayudara. Yo en las cosas de mi casa siempre las hacía yo y no me gustaba que nadie me ayudara. Todo lo ordenaba yo a mi manera. Y fue muy difícil dejarme ayudar. No podía creer que ahora eh, mi familia tenía que cuidarme a mí. Después de, de esto, um, también fue muy duro porque fue justo cuando estaba el COVID. Había muchas restricciones. Eh, yo nunca habíamos tenido COVID, pero al, en el segundo tratamiento de quimioterapia nos dio COVID a toda la familia. Fue muy triste 
porque yo estaba muy débil y no podía ayudar a mi familia. Mi familia estaba muy mal y fue muy duro. Pero salimos adelante. Aprendí que tengo una gran familia que tienen muchas cosas que yo no sabía. Mi esposo es un gran esposo, mis hijas y todos en mi familia. Descubrí cosas que no había en ellos. Um, también uh, sé que Dios es muy grande conmigo. Uh, me puso en un gran equipo de, de doctores. Estoy en la Universidad de Chicago. Mi cuñada es, uh, ayuda en una organización, ayudaba en una organización de cáncer, pero yo no podía estar en su equipo porque éramos familia y me contactó con Judith y con Alas. Gracias a ellas tuve muchísima información que yo necesitaba porque para mí todo era nuevo y todo era, um, era una incertidumbre. No sabía qué hacer, no sabía cómo hacer, no sabía dónde, dónde, las, dónde hacer las preguntas adecuadas. Pero gracias a la organización uh, he aprendido muchísimo y sigo aprendiendo. Cada día sigo aprendiendo. Uh, lo que me gustaría dejar en mensaje es que... Um, Siempre hay que cuidarnos, siempre hay que ir a nuestros chequeos anuales porque uh, el chequeo te cambia la vida. Eh, siempre revísate, siempre acude a tus médicos y a tus chequeos. Cualquier cosa que sientas y aunque no lo sientas, aunque tú pienses que estés bien, revísate cada año porque es un, una bendición encontrar las cosas a tiempo cuando hay a una esperanza de vida y gracias gracias por darme la oportunidad de expresarme me disculpo porque para mí uh, me comen los nervios y es muy difícil hablar pero gracias por darme la oportunidad de estar aquí gracias gracias Petra por las palabras que dijiste por sabíamos que, que era era difícil para hablar pero eh, queríamos tenerte en nuestro panel sos sobreviviente joven, empezaste con el, con el trayecto este hace poco tiempo. Um, el pelo lo tenés precioso, te está creciendo y te está saliendo hermoso, así que estamos, estamos muy contentas. Y, y cuando empezaste recuerdo que estabas, o como empezamos todas, eh, llorisqueando y mal, pero realmente cada vez que te vemos en uno de nuestros programas, o todas las chicas que, que están acá, cada vez que te vemos y siempre con la sonrisa en tu cara, qué importante y, 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 no, y nos pone bien y contentas, ¿no? Um, sí. Eh, tenemos, dos que... opciones. <ríe> tenemos dos opciones. Uh, la enfermedad la tenemos. Tenemos la opción de ver la enfermedad con una cosa positiva o de verla negativa, pero la vamos a tener. Así es que hacerlo más fácil es ser positiva. Trato de ser positiva. No siempre puedo, pero trato. <ríe> y, y, y lo lográs, y lo lográs porque realmente nos encanta ver tu cara a cada momento. Cada cada vez que te vemos, que es casi todas las semanas, así que, y, y tu sonrisa, y, y en los cambios que han pasado. Lo único que quiero decir, algunas cosas que, que escuché en los mensajes que cada una de las chicas estaban diciendo, y Melissa, me puedes decir si hay tiempo para que podamos hacer preguntas y respuestas. Eh, mamogramas, hay que hacerlos, salvan vidas, ser proactivas, proactivos, si hay un cambio, algo, cualquier cosa diferente, nadie mejor que nosotras conocemos a nosotras mismas, a nuestros cuerpos. Cualquier cambio, ir al médico, no esperar. Hablamos y hablaron todas de buscar ayuda y creo que el último mensaje de Petra fue buscar ayuda y conoció a su familia quizá en el momento que estaba pasando por la enfermedad. Qué importante buscar ayuda. Y como latinos muchas veces no buscamos, pensamos que podemos hacer todo solas. Entonces, qué importante realmente abrirnos y buscar esta ayuda. Eh, y como dije antes, los mamogramas salvan vidas y si hay cambios, cualquier cambio, ir al médico. Eh, Janet, no sé si quieres agregar algo. Sí, no, no, también um, los que yo escuché es que las, las mujeres compartieron, es que se rodeen con personas que uno quiere y que quieren a uno. 
que busquen apoyo. Muchas de ellas um, compartieron um, lo importante que ha sido buscar apoyo en organizaciones um, mayormente a las Wings, pero también mencionaron a Guilders Club Chicago, I Remember Angels y Wellness House, so que Yo sepan que, que hay apoyo um, que existe y que deben de buscarla. Um, que formen un, un equipo con su, con, su cuidador, con su cuidador médico, escuché. Y una de las cosas, cosas que también escuché es que, es que abogue uno y que, que ayude a los demás. Creo que muchas de estas mujeres empezaron como um, mujeres diagnosticadas con cáncer, pero a raíz de esta experiencia decidieron que ellas querían abogar y ayudar a las demás. Y eso le ha ayudado a ellas también um, a seguir adelante y encontrar un propósito, ¿verdad? Um, y lo que también escuché um, es que um, busquen información, que se informen sobre su diagnóstico, que eso también les va a ayudar en este proceso. Muchas gracias a todas por compartir sus historias. Y Yuri, no sé si quieres abrirlo a preguntas ahora. Eh, Melissa, no sé, Melissa, eh, ¿qué piensan? Sí tenemos tiempo para preguntas, claro que sí. Okay. Sí, que preferís que lo hagan en el, en el chat y las, y las leamos. Ajá, sí, así está bien, así si tienen preguntas, si quieren alzar la mano y preguntar en la salta, también podemos hacer eso. Está bien. Si quieren, entonces levanten la mano y quieren hacer alguna pregunta. O si quieren hacer algún comentario y decir qué maravillosas son estas mujeres, también lo pueden hacer. Hay un comentario de María, uh, de Erika. Bueno, Erika dijo, gracias a todos ustedes por ser fuerte y compartir sus historias, son una inspiración. Eh, otro comentario de Janine, powerful stories, historias eh, eh, empoderadoras. Y hay una pregunta, gracias. Judy. Muchas, pero, muchas gracias por compartir. Eh, es de Araceli Estrada, la pregunta en, en inglés. Dice, how do you practice self-care and putting yourself first? ¿Cómo practican cuidando su bienestar primero? Si alguna de las panelistas puede, pueden contestar. Berta, levantaste la mano. Sí, en esta, en esta pregunta, uh, como les dije yo, hay, hay que checarse uno, hay que verse uno. Si tú quieres que tu alrededor esté bien, tienes que estar bien tú. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que hay que hacer? Checarse uno constantemente, estar... Uh, a, a manos con sus médicos, a hacerse su autoexámenes, a, de seguida con el médico, para que así cualquier cosa sea a tiempo y no sea un diagnóstico con, con posibilidades de tratamientos largos en lugar de ser los más cortos. Yo quiero añadir, este, si, si está bien, Uh, sí, sí. Es importante hacer ejercicio, uh, ir a terapia. Uh, yo todavía sigo yendo a un terapista porque, claro, no tengo cáncer, gracias a Dios, pero quedé infértil. Y como tengo 38 años uh, y sí, yo tenía deseo de tener más hijos, pero no los puedo tener. Um, también otra cosa que me sucedió es que como tuve quimioterapia y radiación, quedé sin menstruación. So, a los 31 años, no tener menstruación como mujer, pues es muy impactante. So, todas esas cosas este, me pusieron también en una depresión, como um, dijo Liliana, pero yo tuve que um, recapacitar y decir, ok, ¿cómo puedo yo salir adelante y uh, enfocarme en lo positivo? Y entonces uh, yo... Mi, mi, este, lo que me ha ayudado mucho a mí es ir a terapia um, para enfrentar esas cosas y, y platicar de esas cosas que a veces no, no es cómodo platicar de, de, sobre eso. Yo creo que la mayoría de la gente di, diría, oh, no tienes menstruación, no tienes que preocuparte de comprar uh, papel sanitario o, o toallas sanitarias, pero es más... Um, es, las hormonas impactan uh, cómo uno se siente, um, también tiene un, un impacto en lo, lo físico de la mujer. So, es importante también uno escudriñar, leer y investigar. 
para que uno sepa cómo cuidarse uno mismo. Gracias. Gracias, Ashay. Eh, Janet, abrí el micrófono, creo que estás diciendo algo. Sí, que hay otra pregunta para el panel que dice aquí, es de Diana Sánchez, dice, ¿cómo puedo apoyar a alguien que ha sido recientemente diagnosticada con cáncer de mama BRCA1? Y creo que lo que Petra compartió, ¿verdad? Que ella también es impactada genéticamente um, por esto. Petra, no sé si um, tienes algunas palabras de consejo para Diana, que dice, ¿cómo apoyar a alguien que ha sido recientemente diagnosticada? Claro, uh, para mí fue muy difícil esta noticia, pero pienso que cuando alguien tiene esta mutación necesitas escucharla. Primero que nada escucharla, darle su tiempo para que ella se, se exprese ante ti y, y siempre de esto tienes que to tiene que tomar la persona que al saber que uno es diagnosticado con BRCA, Tienes la opción de que tu familia con tiempo vaya a hacerse un chequeo de, de esta mutación. Entonces, sería, es bueno a la vez porque sabes lo que tienes y sabes a qué te afrontas. Y pues puedes investigar un poquito más sobre, sobre esta mutación. Es difícil porque uno, para, bueno, para mí fue muy difícil, no por mí, sino por, por mis hijas. Yo era lo que más pensaba, pero uh, ahora lo veo de otra manera. Lo veo que tengo la oportunidad de que ellas uh, se hagan el estudio con tiempo. Solamente quiero comentar. Uh, gracias, mujeres poderosas. Este, pero para tus historias, su fuerza. <risa> lo siento mucho. Pero quiero comentar que este somos hispanas, pero este historias y su experiencia se afecta otras culturas. Si hablamos de chino o swahili, todo son las mismas emociones que tenemos y necesitamos que no solamente pensar este charla es solamente para los hispanos, es para todas nosotras digo nosotros porque los hombres también sufren de cáncer y los niños. Son muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Lo agradezco. Gracias, Henrietta, por tus comentarios. No sé si alguien más en el panel en el último minuto quisiera añadir a lo que dijo Petra, cómo apoyar a alguien con un diagnóstico de cáncer. No, yo pienso que lo que dijo Petra es básicamente eso, el, un diagnóstico de cáncer con un factor genético, eh, hablar con el médico, por supuesto, y sí, eh, exactamente lo que dijo Petra, eh, cuando uno tiene eh, una mutación genética, tiene que tener más en cuenta, esto ya no es so simplemente, ok, tengo cáncer yo, sino cómo proteger a la familia en el futuro, porque si hay un factor genético, puede ser que alguien más en la familia tenga esto y pueda pasar por esto en el futuro. Entonces, creo que eso es lo más importante, educarse, saberlo, escucharlo y realmente tener sesiones con el médico, especialmente si uno tiene hijas, mujeres o varones, pero en el futuro van a tener que hacerse seguramente estos estudios genéticos, que a veces no queremos escucharlo y cuando nos dan, ya cuando nos dan, nos dan un diagnóstico de cáncer, ya es muy duro escuchar esto, al, además, escuchar además que uno tiene una mutación genética donde tiene que hacer eh, pro, posiblemente este, tratamientos un poco más agresivos para quitar todo esto, ¿no? Entonces, sí, es, eh, esta información hay que saberla y hay que tra transmitirla a la familia. Así que gracias, Petra, por, por lo que dijiste, porque es, es, es así, eh, aunque a uno no le guste escucharlo. Sí. Yo quisiera también hacer énfasis nuevamente acerca de tratar de buscar ayuda. El, tu network, el grupo de gente con el que te rodeas, a quien quieres, quien te ama, pero además asociaciones que es donde vas a conseguir ayuda, donde hay gente que ya está pasando por eso, que ya lo superó, que te puede orientar. Y nos llevan de la mano. Ustedes nos han llevado de la mano durante todo este tiempo. Yo tengo 13 años de sobreviviente de cáncer y siguen ustedes tomándome de la mano para poder salir adelante, para poder sentirme fuerte, para estar mejor. Gracias, muchachas. Gracias a todas ustedes. Gracias a su tiempo, su vida, su dedicación toda esa ayuda que nos han dado. Muchas gracias. 
Gracias Liliana. Y lo que dijo Enrieta, esto, todo esto que estamos hablando Enrieta, eh, es todas las culturas, todas las personas pasan por esto, así que sí, hoy se hizo en español y lo hablamos desde el punto de vista de mujeres latinas, pero el cáncer de mama eh, no, ve, no ve quién es, es cultural, Toda, todas las mujeres que tienen mamas pueden tener cáncer de mama o cáncer cervical en este caso. Janet. No, 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 no tengo mucho que añadir porque estoy bien conmovida con todas estas historias y también quiero hacer hinca, um, hincapié de que, como dijo Enrieta, esto, la, esto, tener un diagnóstico de cáncer no tan solo afecta a los latinos, es algo universal, ¿verdad? Es algo que afecta a todas las culturas en todas partes del mundo. La única diferencia es que algunas personas tienen más recursos que otros, ¿verdad? Y por eso estamos aquí, porque queremos conectar a las personas a los recursos para que sepan que sí pueden conseguir apoyo, pues sí pueden conseguir cuidados de salud, Um, y eso es muy importante y también escuché que se dijo de que, creo que lo dijo Petra, ¿verdad? Que es importante que todas um, se hagan sus exámenes de prevención de cáncer, ¿verdad? No tan solo las mamografías, pero también los exámenes de cáncer de la próstata, también los exámenes del cáncer cervical, también los exámenes del cáncer de pulmón. Todo eso es muy, muy importante porque hacerse todos esos exámenes pueden salvar vidas y, y con eso queremos dejarlos y con esto también queremos darle las gracias a todas las organizaciones, no tan solo a las WINGS, a todas las universidades. Um, en la Universidad de Illinois que yo represento, pero todas las universidades académicas, todas las organizaciones comunitarias que brindan apoyo a personas impactadas por el cáncer. Muchísimas gracias um, por todo lo que hacen. Hay una pregunta más que uh, pusieron en el chat, que es cómo podemos hablar con nuestras familias sobre nuestros riesgos gen genéticos de cáncer. Es la pregunta. La mayoría de los hospitales, cuando uno le dan un diagnóstico, la mayoría de los hospitales tienen consejeros genéticos. Entonces, eh, para hablar con la familia, eh, el consejo sería hablar con los médicos, que son los que van a recomendar hacer este estudio genético. Y una vez, si uno llegara a tener una mutación genética por, eh, en base al estudio que se ha hecho, eh, todos los hospitales tienen consejero genético, entonces esto sería, y los consejeros genéticos no solamente se reúnen con el sobreviviente de, de cáncer en este caso, sino que también se reúnen con la familia del sobreviviente. Entonces se habla en familia y se discute en familia, y se discute en familia qué pasos a seguir, qué estudios hay que hacer de aquí en adelante una vez que tiene uno una mutación. Así que eso sería la recomendación eh, hablar con el médico que va a recomendar entonces este estudio y una vez que este estudio sí es positivo, el, los consejeros genéticos de cada hospital son los que tienen que reunirse con la familia para hablar sobre este tema. Pero antes de ese paso también que hincapié de que debemos de estar teniendo estas conversaciones con nuestras familias. ¿Verdad? Yo he conocido tantas personas que tú les preguntas, ¿y cuál es la historia, la historia genética de tu familia? Historia médica, y muchos dicen, yo no sé, yo no sé de qué tuvo mi papá, no sé de qué murió mi papá, no sé de qué murió mi mamá. Entonces so, tenemos que hacer, hacer, darle importancia a conocer un poco la historia médica de nuestros familiares, porque esto va a ser una gran diferencia um, en cómo uno nos acercamos a los cuidados de servicio médico y, con, y conozcamos un poco de cuál es nuestro riesgo, ¿verdad? Y he conocido bastantes personas, no hablan de estas cosas en sus familias. So, tenemos que, que empezar a tener estas conversaciones en nuestras familias, hacer estas conversaciones no, partes normales de las cosas que hablamos en familia para poder um, saber y, y planear, ¿verdad? Debo de hacerme este examen porque estoy más, más, más predispuesta a tener diabetes, a tener alta presión, a tener este cáncer. Es so, muy importante empezar estas conversaciones desde, muy, desde que uno es muy joven um, a, a hablar un poco de la historia y conocer la historia um, médica de sus familias. Cierto. Y no sé si alguna... ¿Otra pregunta? Yuri, no sé si quieres cerrar. No, simplemente agradecer nuevamente al grupo de Chicago Check y a las universidades UIC, Northwestern y Northeastern University uh, por permitir hacer eventos como estos. 
eh, porque de la mejor manera que podamos saber más es si nos reunimos, si hablamos y si de esto se habla abiertamente eh, con paneles como el que hemos tenido hoy. Eh, no sé si eh, Melissa o alguna de las chicas, o Enrieta o alguna de las chicas de, de, de Chicago Check quieran eh, continuar con esto o quieren cerrar este panel, pero en nombre de Alas Wings y de las y UIC eh, con nuestra querida Janet, queremos agradecerles a cada una de las este, panelistas de, del día de hoy que nos se han preparado, que han estudiado, que han, re, re, han rehecho una revisión de lo que les pasó quizá algunas hace mucho tiempo o algunas nuevas eh, eh, sobrevivientes como las chicas que tenemos hoy. Gracias por el tiempo que le pusieron a esto, porque hemos estudiado y hemos practicado, así que gracias a todas por estar aquí y por habernos permitido escuchar un poquito más acerca de sus historias. Melissa. Oh. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think we have a break scheduled for 12 .15, and so we're just going to take a little bit of a break until 12 .15, and then we will begin our mindfulness activity with um, Dr. So I see Dr. Mangesha is with us. Hi, Dr. Mangesha, how are you? Um, so we're going okay. to be having our mindfulness activity just like we did yesterday um, with Thanks. Dr. Mangesha leading us. And um, again, we're going to be on our break from 12.15 until 12.25. Um, so you can go ahead and participate in the mindfulness activity with us. It's completely optional. Or you can go ahead and take your break, step away from your computer, go get a snack, use the bathroom. And we look forward to this activity with Dr. Mikesha. Hi, Dr. Mikesha, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much, Maxon. Thank you to everyone. Um, uh, just as I had uh, yesterday, I had the wonderful privilege of walking you all through a mindful, mindfulness activity. I plan to do so as well today. Uh, before doing so, I just want to acknowledge the wonderful contributions of our panelists. Thank you so much for brave, bravely sharing your stories. Um, Petra, uh, Liliana, Berta, um, Aurelia, and Sasha, thank you so much uh, for sharing your stories with us. We appreciate hearing from you and to Judy and Jeanette for your wonderful job facilitating the really enriching discussion. Um, I think that the panelists are always the highlight of uh, this forum. So appreciate you, your willingness to share your story with us. Um, I'm going to, yesterday I walked you through a mindfulness activity that was uh, focused on a, a body scan. And today I'm going to walk you through a breath, sound, and body meditation. So just as Max had mentioned, please feel free to uh, join in, participate in any way that feels good for you. Um, take care of yourselves during this uh, interim, uh, use the restroom, what have you. Um, if you care to engage with us, um, I, I um, appreciate you doing so. So we'll just begin by finding a comfortable position in your chair. Think about lighting in your room, whether you need it dim. Um, if you have your video on, feel free to keep it on or to turn it off, whatever is your preference. This is your time. I will, for the next about 10 minutes, be walking you through this meditation exercise, and your only job will be to simply follow my voice. So you can find your meditation posture, sitting in a way that's neither too tight nor too relaxed, but comfortable and upright. Then notice your body from the inside, Noticing the shape and the weight and the touch in areas you may make contact with the floor or your chair, the way your spine touches the back of your chair, maybe the way your arms are resting on your chair. And you can focus on your breathing, feeling your breathing. 
in the area of either the abdomen or the chest, the nostrils. Feeling the gentle rising and falling of your abdomen or chest. The coolness in and out sensations at your nostrils. So the breath is our anchor. It's where we establish our awareness, it helps us have something to always return to. The simple act of breathing. Now you might notice that other things pull your attention away from your breath. And that might be sound for some, touch for others. So right now, just for a moment, bring your attention to the sounds. If you can, if you are able. Inside the room, outside the room. Simply taking it in. It may be pleasant sounds, unpleasant. Listen to them with curiosity and interest. Noticing them coming and going. without getting caught up in a story about what that sound is or why it is there, simply just taking notice. If even noticing the sound of silence. Now bring your attention to your body and notice if there are body sensations to be aware of. There might be pressure or tightness or maybe movement or vibration or heat or cold or tingling. Notice which sensations call out to you and let your attention go to them. Maybe it's very strong and obvious or maybe subtle, simple sensations. Just notice them. You might notice yourself jumping from sensation to sensation, or maybe there's one that grabs your attention and holds it, particularly if it's unpleasant. You might notice it. As you're noticing it, is it growing or shrinking, moving? Does it pulse or throb or maybe even ache? Now your job is simply to notice it with curiosity. Now is not the time to make up a whole story about the experience, just being directly with the sensation in your body. As our breath is our anchor, let's return to your breathing. Finding your breath as you continue in this meditation, you'll stay with your breath, one breath at a time. If you notice yourself lost in thoughts, you can say thinking or wandering, just fine, no judgment. Just redirect your attention, returning back to our anchor, returning back to our breath. If you find a sound or maybe for some a body sensation becomes so obvious and strong, you can't any longer stay with your breath because it pulls your attention away, then let yourself Go to the breath. Focus on the body, the sound, listen to it, feel it, 
he aprendido muchísimo. Until it no longer holds your attention or it's stopped. And at that point, go back to the breathing, returning to the simplicity of your anger that's always with you. And once again, noticing your whole body sitting here tuning into the shape and the posture, maybe the movement. Are you sitting tall? Are you leaning to one side or the other? Simply take note. Letting yourself relax. And wish yourself well. May I be happy and at ease. May I be free from stress and anxiety. May I be peaceful. Let yourself consider the possibility. Again, let yourself relax, wishing yourself well. May I be happy and at ease. May I be free from stress and anxiety. May I be peaceful. Consider these possibilities of finding peace and being at ease. Consider these possibilities for a moment as you sit in silence. What will this look like for you today to be happy and at ease? and free from stress and peaceful. As you begin to find yourself in your chair with us today, bringing your attention back to the larger group, and getting ready for the next half of the community forum. My hope is, is that you will take these wishes um, to be happy and at ease and free from stress and anxiety and to be peaceful and hold those near and dear to you today through the rest of the forum, through the rest of your evening and through the weekend and beyond. I wanna pause just for a moment to say that this is another self-care activity that you can gift yourself with uh, almost wherever, whenever, wherever you are. Uh, there are several of these um, applications that you can find on, on an app um, um, online um, in several different languages. Uh, so I encourage you to think about gifting yourself in this way. This particular one that I walked you through is through the UCLA Mindfulness Awareness Research Center, and it's a wonderful uh, breadth of resources for mindfulness and meditation, uh, both in audio and script form um, that are free. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Maxon, for allowing me to walk you all through this mindfulness activity. Of course, thank you so much, Dr. Mangesha, for again, taking us to that amazing activity. I feel almost all of my stress from the week just gone. So that was awesome. <laughs> um, and now, thanks so much. Um, we're going to go on to the next session for today. So our second session. And this section is on the impact of COVID-19 on cancer screening. And so it's a community-led collaboration with Chicago Tech. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Keith Naley, Dr. Fred Rackman, Carmen Velasquez, Dr. Kareem Watson, and Dr. Masahito Jimbo. Welcome everyone, and the floor is yours, Dr. Nele. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm Mas Jimbo. I'm the um, uh, moderator uh, for this uh, panel discussion. So I would first like to uh, introduce Dr. Keith Naylor. He is one of our young stars uh, in uh, cancer health equity research. 
uh, assistant professor at the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago and a gastroenterologist, but perhaps more importantly, he is a loving husband and father of two young children. Uh, often in our early uh, morning meetings, uh, he cannot use his camera because he's uh, dropping off his kids at school. So um, Keith will be uh, first giving us the background information about how this, this research that was originated by the community members uh, came into being and uh, how it is progressing. Uh, followed by his presentation will be a panel discussion, but uh, Keith, please go right on ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'll do my best to try to uh, speak clearly and, and uh, slowly enough so that those of us who are relying on interpreters can also follow along and also um, walk us through the slides just to make sure, can everyone see uh, the first screen for the introductory screen? Yes, okay, wonderful. Yes, we can. Um, so uh, as Dr. Jimbo was nice enough to mention, my name is uh, Dr. Keith Naylor and I am a gastroenterologist. I'm also one of the outreach core leads in Chicago Check. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on cancer screening, uh, specifically discussing the project as a way to um, introduce the idea of community and academic partnerships to try to improve care in Chicago. Um, so to begin, uh, I think obviously there's really no need to introduce COVID-19 as something that's been uh, a, a clear change in the world and in the United States and in Chicago in particular. I use this slide uh, to remind us of how far we've come, uh, but in 2020 when COVID-19 was first detected, uh, obviously that was a time where uh, we didn't have a vaccine and there were uh, many, many people becoming infected with COVID-19 very frequently across Chicago as well as elsewhere. And this uh, map that I have uh, shown shows the different community areas across Chicago and the mortality or death rate related to COVID-19 over the year of 2020. And I show this both to show the impact of COVID-19, but also to show that different communities were affected uh, in, at greater degrees than others from COVID-19. And what you'll see is that the areas that are more darkly uh, colored are those communities that had higher death rate from COVID-19 uh, during the year of 2020. And many of those communities were areas where many of the residents are African-American or Latinx, or in some cases, other residents who may live in areas that are underserved or maybe areas that suffer from poverty or other um, social determinants of health that may lead them to have greater exposure to COVID-19 or less care that then led to them having a greater uh, mortality rate from the disease. Uh, we know that in Cook County, uh, there's been more than a million cases of COVID-19 and more than 15,000 deaths from the disease. So it certainly is a disease that has affected all of us. And I'll be using this as an example to describe some of the ways that we're trying to uh, use the opportunity to see how care is being delivered to not just improve care related to COVID-19, but also improve care related to other chronic diseases that have um, been affected by COVID-19. So uh, this uh, pie chart or slide just further shows that different populations within Chicago have been affected in different ways from COVID-19. Once again, these are um, the death rate from COVID-19 and each of the different colors uh, describe a different community. So in this case, the uh, sort of lilac or purple color is for the Hispanic and Latino community. Uh, the green color is for the non-Hispanic black community. The white color is for the non-Hispanic white community and the orange is for Asian or Pacific Islander community. And what you can see is that although we all share the same city, uh, primarily the non-Hispanic black community and the Hispanic community were more greatly impacted in terms of deaths from COVID-19. And there are many reasons for this, but it's just to show that certain communities uh, seem to be more affected by these conditions as well as many other conditions that are in many cases preventable or highly treatable. Um, to highlight this even further, we know that because of the effects directly of COVID-19, uh, certain communities, as I mentioned, had a greater uh, death rate, and that actually led to a decrease in life expectancy for the year of 2019, or excuse me, 2020 compared to previously in 2019. And what you'll see is that within the Latinx community in Chicago, 
there was actually a three year drop in life ex expectancy in 2020 compared to 2019. And that was greater than that um, observed in any other group. Other groups had about a two year drop in life expectancy. And it's believed that many of the uh, effects of COVID-19 weren't only related to the virus, but also related to worsening of many chronic diseases that many people pre had previously, that then because of the disease or because of the inability to continue to receive care, they had worse outcomes related to those conditions. Um, what you'll see in the second uh, bullet point is that around 27% of our Latinx community and 26% of our um, Black community reported missing urgent medical visits due to COVID-19. And this was much greater than that seen in our uh, white counterparts that were around 9% showing that COVID-19 had a great impact on people's ability to access care, either because of changes in um, the ability to actually see the doctor, or in some cases, the fear of going out in the community and actually seeking care. Um, many of the patients or individuals who uh, were highly affected by COVID-19 across Chicago are also our community members who tend to seek care at community health centers. Community health centers are health centers that are located across Chicago and across other areas as well uh, that serve many of our community members who um, may have uh, public insurance such as Medicaid or in some cases Medicare, but also those who uh, live in communities who are not served by large academic centers. Some of the most important aspects of community health centers I've highlighted here and I'll just go through them, through them briefly. One is that uh, community health centers serve about one in 10 of the US population. And many of those who, who they serve are those affected by disparities or worsening uh, care, worsen outcomes related to conditions like heart disease or diabetes or hypertension. So these are patients who already uh, require a, a very, um, you know, uh, they require care in a way where we can hope to bring them to a point where they are reaching the same kind of outcomes is those of us who are receiving care at some of the more um, you know, uh, academic centers or larger hospitals. In many cases, uh, the required care that they're receiving also is specific to the community they live in. And these uh, healthcare centers are located in the community. So they know many of the effects that the community is experiencing. And they practice through a comprehensive care model that not only delivers uh, healthcare related to the things that we normally uh, think about healthcare, but also dental care, behavioral health care, um, health education, um, and screening services as well. Uh, and those would fall into preventative health care, which the idea is to prevent or detect disease when it's early and, and most treatable. And then lastly, in many cases, the community health centers actually outperform many of our um, larger academic centers and care for many of these most vulnerable populations. So to use one example of a, a community health uh, center group, um, Alliance Chicago is one of the community health center groups that are here in Chicago that care for a very large uh, number of our, our residents. Over 250,000 patients are seen within um, their community health centers or, uh, each year. And what you'll see is in this map of Chicago, each of the bubbles represent one of the sites that are a community health center that partners with Alliance Chicago. So they care for patients across Chicago. Um, we'll be talking later about using this as a way to see how care uh, changed in the way that care was delivered within the Alliance Chicago group as a result of COVID. One thing that became apparent, and this is looking at patients who received care at Alliance Chicago, is that in 2020, when COVID first began, there was a, a very significant decrease in the way care was delivered. And what you'll see in this graph is that for each month of the year that's represented um, for each of those bars, you'll see that in the beginning before COVID became really an apparent problem in January and February, uh, there were greater than uh, 236,000 visits uh, that patients were be, being seen for at these community health centers. But in February, when COVID first began to be recognized, you'll see a drastic decrease in the number of visits where people were actually seeing their doctor face-to-face, -face, which is represented by the blue bars. But um, as we recognize that patients weren't able to, be, to see their doctor physically, patients began seeing their doctor virtually like we're having the conference today. And those are represented in the red bars. And that became, began to become more common 
um, in March, April, May, and even through to today. And what you see is that there was a great impact in care where instead of seeing your doctor face-to-face, -face, we began to use other ways to deliver care. But there's some aspects of care that are very difficult to deliver virtually, and we'll talk about some of that moving forward. One of the things to keep in mind about uh, community health centers is their care centers that are really focused on delivering primary care services to their patient populations. And one of the services that they focus on is also the uh, prevention of cancer through screening and early detection. And many of you who see doctors for primary care know that at certain ages that your doctor will recommend that you undergo certain cancer screening examinations. And many of those exams can actually be done in the community healthcare center site or in sites sort of related directly to your primary care doctor. Those exams may include things like mammography for breast cancer screening, uh, stool-based testing like uh, FIT testing for colorectal cancer screening, or prostate-specific antigen testing, which is a blood test for detection of prostate cancer. In many cases, patients will receive these tests through their community um, healthcare centers, but in the cases where those patients require further testing, such as when a mammography may show a concerning area or a stool-based test may show the evidence of blood in the stool or a PSA test may be slightly elevated, you may be referred to see a specialist or another type of doctor at a hospital or an academic center that then will undergo further testing to see whether or not there's actually something to be concerned about. Um, so generally, these two groups of doctors work very well together. And we'll talk about how some of those things may have changed during COVID and how we hope to look into that to make sure that we're caring for everyone appropriately. Um, one thing that we do know from uh, information related to the beginning of COVID is that nationwide, that many people had a decrease in their ability to undergo cancer screening. And in some cases, when COVID was causing um, you know, shutdowns uh, in terms of healthcare centers, and here at UIC, for a period of time, we actually were no longer doing things like screening colonoscopies. We see that things like breast cancer screening initially decreased by as much as 90%, colon cancer screening by almost 80%, and prostate cancer screening by 63%. So that was a, a great change in the way we were able to deliver preventative care, and particularly in the ability to provide uh, screening and early detection for patients who would be normally undergoing those exams. Through the outreach core at CHECK, we frequently have meetings where we discuss ways where we can improve cancer care for everyone in Chicago with a focus on the most vulnerable communities. And this slide shows many of those of us who are involved in the outreach core. Um, I wanna highlight that uh, Dr. Uh, Varnicky, who this uh, forum is named after, was also a part of our group as well. And we would frequently have conversations about how we really need to focus on improving the care in terms of cancer screening and early detection in Chicago. One of the key uh, parts of our core is our community steering committee. And those are members from the community who help us remember to really focus on the most pressing issues in the community when, when it, when, in regards to uh, cancer care. And during these conversations, in February, when COVID was really um, the sort of factor that was affecting cancer screening in our communities to such a high level, one of our most beloved uh, community um, steering committee members, uh, Carmen Velasquez, brought up the idea of asking the question, what happened to our patients with regard to cancer screening diagnosis and treatment? And how can we use data or research to really find out what happened during this time and how we can improve cancer care and not miss the opportunity to deliver the best care to our community. As a group, we began thinking about that question. And since that time, we've been meeting months, once monthly to discuss how we can look as a group using research to look into Chicago to see how we're doing in regards to cancer uh, prevention and screening. One difficulty when it comes to cancer screening, as I mentioned before, is that a patient may undergo their screening test through their community health center, but then actually receive further diagnostic testing at one of the hospitals or academic centers in Chicago. 
And many times it can be difficult to actually follow a patient from one healthcare institution through to another institution. So through our core community environment, we actually were able to have a discussion about a very important resource that's available in Chicago called Capricorn, which stands for the Chicago Area Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Network. It's a, a group of academic centers, community healthcare centers, uh, patient advocates and community members that allow for sharing of patient information across healthcare centers, which really provides us the opportunity to look how care is delivered in different settings. And what you'll see here is many of the healthcare centers that you may recognize across Chicago, which are included in Capricorn. So that would allow us to actually look at how care is delivered in each of these different locations. Some of the aims of the Capricorn network are to use data to actually look at how we can improve healthcare quality, health outcomes, and health equity in diverse patient populations across Chicago. And it provides an infrastructure for us to ask important research questions and look at health data that these days is actually recorded electronically so that we can determine whether or not patients are receiving the same type of care and having outcomes that are um, things that we would hope that for them to have based on the care that we're delivering. And then lastly, and importantly, uh, Capricorn is very focused on uh, protecting patient health information and making sure that all of the information related to patient care is um, used in a way where we're not exposing anyone to the risk of having their information um, uh, looked at inappropriately. So lastly, going back to this idea of how we have a relationship between community healthcare centers and other hospitals and medical centers, uh, COVID led to somewhat of a, a strain in that relationship where in many cases, wait times and the ability to communicate with healthcare centers was strained due to the fact that we were focused so much on caring for patients with COVID. And uh, today I performed uh, four screening colonoscopies and actually uh, two of the patients commented without me asking that it's been a year since they requested their screening colonoscopy until the time we were actually able to do it today. And many of these things we were seeing in regards to care for screening in this population, which leads to the concern that patients may not be able to access care or be able to receive diagnostic testing in a timely fashion. So um, to round this out, using the sort of recommendations of our community steering committee and the discussion of our, our core um, group, we're able to come up with a question of how we could look into this in the Chicago community to make sure that we are actually uh, providing the sort of screening and diagnostic care that we should to the community. And the question we'll be asking is how did COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19 change the follow-up of patients who underwent screening for colorectal breast or prostate cancer and then had an abnormal screening test? So normally, if you have a screening test and your test requires further follow-up, we hope that you would receive that follow-up within approximately six months of your initial test. But because of COVID and issues with wait times and communication, there's a concern that that was not happening in the same way. The way that we hope to look into this question is to look at patients aged 45 to 75 years who completed breast, prostate, or colorectal cancer screening uh, during the time before COVID and during COVID and up until December of last year. Then we'll follow patients as they receive their initial screening through the Alliance Chicago Community Health Centers, and then look at where they went to receive their diagnostic testing through the uh, facilities that are part of the Capricorn network. What I show in this last chart is that there are many patients who receive screening through the Community Health Center through Alliance Chicago. In this case, 14,000 patients for breast cancer screening, 11,000 for prostate cancer screening, and more than 23,000 for colon cancer screening. And of those during the time of the study, uh, more than 1,000 had abnormal mammographies, more than 2,000 had abnormal prostate-specific antigen testing, and more than 3,000 had abnormal stool-based cancer screening testing. And we'll be looking at this patient population to see the timing at which they were able to get further testing and to make sure that their outcomes were not affected 
by the issues that happened during the COVID pandemic. The goal of this research is really to provide information on how healthcare access and quality was changed as a result of the pandemic and then be able to highlight the patient populations or community areas that were most affected by the pandemic and ideally to um, develop interventions that we can improve cancer care moving forward. And um, lastly, and hopefully in the future, to, divide, to um, influence policy decisions that may be used if we ever have similar issues related to um, pandemics like COVID, like right now, the um, you know, effects of monkeypox are also affecting the healthcare center, but to make sure that we know how to protect our most vulnerable populations and continue to allow them to receive the care that they deserve, even when other issues are causing strain to the healthcare system. So I hope that that was an example of how we have come together as a um, community and as academic centers to try to answer important questions about healthcare delivery and how to provide the best healthcare. Um, and just quickly, uh, this study is being supported through the U University of Illinois Cancer Center's uh, 2022 uh, Community Outreach and Engagement Seed Grant. And then of course, uh, Chicago Check is supported by the National Cancer Institute, um, which allows us to do this important work. Um, lastly, I'll turn this back over to Dr. Jimbo so that we can uh, begin our panel discussion to talk about so how this uh, uh, collaboration has developed and how we can continue to do these important um, research studies in the future with a focus on the community. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you so much, Keith. So in addition to Keith and myself, we have three additional panelists. First, we have Dr. Kareem Watson. He was uh, as a phenomenal community uh, based statistical researcher at Miles Square. In fact, he was so good that the National Institute of Health took notice and uh, recruited him away from us. And he's now a chief engagement officer of the All of Us Research Program at the NIH. And we're still traumatized by his absence here. <laughs> and then obviously with the community-based statistical research, it's truly a partnership. We're seeking a partnership where the community members provide um, uh, just as much, if not more, into the research efforts we have. And really, the two other panelists, uh, Ms. Carmen Velasquez, uh, who's the founder, past executive director of Alivio Medical Center, and Dr. Fred Rackman, the CEO of the Chicago Alliance. These two have been phenomenal in uh, helping us kind of re uh, create the research question as far as push it along to uh, kind of create a uh, uh, an actual research project uh, where we can try to uh, measure the outcomes. And so first um, first of all, I like to you know address everybody by first names and uh, starting off with a uh, comment, really what what led you to that question, that the fabulous question you had in that slide um, that started this whole thing, which is really phenomenal. And um, you know, uh, when the pandemic started, everything else was so much like in flux and com in confusion. How you were able to come up with such a clear question is still um, amazes me. And I'd like to you to kind of um, elaborate a bit on that. Oh, you're muted, Carmen. Oh, you're still muted. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be part of this uh, panel and a two-day session. Um, what really pushed my, um, my person to be part of this is when uh, we were working in the community at, at uh, Alivio Medical Center, one of the things uh, and other uh, not-for-profits uh, understood were academia, universities, uh, and other organizations were coming to us and said, well, let us do a study. Let us do some research. Uh, let's uh, identify a focus group. Uh, we'll give uh, the people who participate in a focus group uh, a certificate or X amount of dollars. And it, they do the study, they would leave, come and not come back to us and say, this is what we found and this is what we have to do. That really angered me. But at the same time, recognizing without those entities, we cannot really help our community. So I wanted to put my, my grain of salt that said, we have value, the community has value. We need to be listened to. And so you have patients, you, the community, 
who go to the uh, community health centers and are cared for. So we need to listen to us. And so I said, why not use this network of human beings, you, to become part of a project that makes sense to us as we continue our, our quest and saying, what is happening to me? And the other thing is the trust factor. I think uh, Joanne Glenn said very well, uh, we have to trust you. If we don't trust you, we don't let you into our home. We don't let you into our lives. We don't tell you how we feel, honestly. I'll tell you a little bit about me, but not everything. So I need, really believe that this collaboration, that the acceptance of having universities, academia say to us as community, you know, we can really do something. So for this, I am very, very excited. Thank you so much, Carmen. You know, one word that resonated with me <laughs> when, you, uh, when you were speaking was the word anger. Um, about so it seems like you know we as a researcher as like group of bandits who come in and swipe your data <laughs> and then go our merry ways. Um, in, in what in what ways have you found this particular uh, relationship collaboration hopefully to be different <laughs> than the previous situations where you found uh, that you you were ang uh, angry about? Well, the willingness to uh, to do something different, to make a difference, and follow up, and also to value what we had to say. I believe as we listened to the uh, people who have had cancer, we are now listening to them. Academia, imagine, PhDs, researchers are now listening to our community and to our needs. Not only that we're sick and we're afraid, we now have someone who's gonna say, we can support you, we can help you. Well, thank you so much, Carmen. And uh, Fred, um, as uh, from your perspective as uh, the CEO of Alliance of Chicago, how did Carmen's question, how did that resonate with you? And uh, how did you feel that this question should be propelled forward so that it can be answered? Sure. Well, uh... We were, I was thrilled to hear Carmen's question because this Carmen knows, you know, we've been laboring to help community health centers uh, uh, enter and actually be leaders in the information age. So first of all, by adopting electronic health records, which for all the bad things we say about it, what it's done is it's allowed us to collect the data uh, that we put um, in the process of care that we deliver and put it in a format where it's available for all kinds of other uses. And, you know, I, I, I really just have to say what a powerful morning, like hearing Berta and Petra and Sasha and Liliana and Aurelia tell us their individual stories. And we as healthcare providers, that's the level at which we work on a daily basis. But then when you put that all together, there's a tremendous power in being able to aggregate those stories, uh, the way that we can do it in the modern information age. I mean, I think of like, you know, those of you that ever use a navigation program and you see like, how are we able to do that? Like, how are we able to tell how long it will take to get from point A to B if we walk or we take a car? The way we can do that is in real time, we can aggregate individual observations together and then have a big picture that lets us see what's going on. And in healthcare, that's really important because that helps us better design programs. It helps us change the way we deliver care. It helps us advocate for change. And so uh, all this work we've done to make data available in that way comes to life when Carmen asks a question like she asked. And I'm hoping that in addition to the the answers that we come out of this project, I'm hopeful that by sharing this with all of you today out there in the community, that you start to ask those questions. Help us use this tremendous power that we have in collecting this data in the course of our interactions and, and be able to look at it in, in a big enough picture that allows us to really drive change. Great, uh, th thank you so much. And I think the key is, it sounds like 
you know, ongoing collaboration, ongoing relationship, bi-directional, equal partners, and making mm-hmm. sure that the findings are then placed back into the community to make something good out of it. So, mm-hmm. so Kareem, <laughs> thank you for the thumbs up, Fred. Um, Kareem, you've been a, a, a community-based researcher for a long time and you have great expertise. And um, what do you see are the key gre- ingredients of a successful uh, community academia partnership in a research like this? And what would you, what would you like now from the perspective of NIH um, to, you know, <laughs> for, for, for this to come out of, um, you know, uh, how the findings can then be put back to the community and put into uh, good use? Uh, what would be your kind of vision uh, from the uh, NIH perspective? Thank you for that question. Um, I still find it interesting that I'm speaking on behalf of the NIH because for so long, I was very vocal against the NIH. So it's, it's really interesting. I, I was surprised when they hired me because I remember telling them the program was some of us, not all of us. And so I kept thinking that was going to come up at our interview, but it didn't, luckily. But I'm always excited to be here with my Chicago Czech family. One of the things, as trained as a community-based producer or researcher, um, One of the things I say, and this comes out of the school of Dr. Linda Ray Murray too, is to understand that the system is inequitable to start with, right? Mm -hmm. That you're you're doing this work within a system that was not designed to necessarily be equitable and that wasn't designed to put the resources in the hands of the populations that need them the most. We see that within community academic partnerships and we definitely see that within organizations. When I came to our program, we were working with historically black colleges and universities. And so I said, where's the funding going to these historically black college universities? And that, you know, they told me about the application process. And I said, most HBCUs are not gonna be able to navigate this. You got some of the bigger ones that are gonna be able to navigate this, but some of your smaller historically black college universities. This morning I was speaking to Haku and the Hispanic survey institutions. And we have to do more capacity building to put resources in the hands of the community to allow them to do this work and to not have them be restricted in in how they do it. One of the things I learned in community-based participatory research through people like Ms. Joanne and and, and others is also to not be afraid of of the conflict that will arise in doing this work. It's not personal but it's going to be some conflict that will arise. Your com- if, and I tell researchers, I tell young students, I say, if you never get checked by your community members, you're not doing this work right. If you've never gotten, and I don't wanna say yell that, but if you've never had a tough conversation, and Henrietta's laughing because we've had some tough conversations where you know, if you've never had a community member to do an intervention with you on how you're doing this work, you're probably not doing this work right. Because inevitably, you, the two systems sometimes operate against each other. So, and you always have to have that, that community member pushing you to do those things that the system likely will not have you do. Um, I'll end with when I was dealing with my brother's transition from colorectal cancer last year, I had to be the one serving as a patient navigator for him. And I told his doctors, I shouldn't have to be a cancer disparities researcher to make his nephrologist talk to the cardiologist to talk to the oncologist. You all have electronic health record system. You can send a message to those providers. But, and and so just reminding them how to do that, but I was able to force that conversation as a family member, but I should not have been the one to have to force that. The system should have been able to do, do that in a way that connected all of his specialists so that he could have got the best care possible. Great, thank you so much, Karimi. And so uh, when we say, you know, the the system lacks equity, uh, uh, let's face it, the system is racist, right? (laughs) Um, And and then there are the groups that, you know, get the short end of the stick because of that uh, systemic inequity. Um, and I think we as a group is trying to change that. And uh, a, a comment of Fred, I, I really would like you to kind of respond to what Kareem had just said, you know, from the community perspective and perhaps Keith as well, you know, and what we can do from the academic side. How can we and uh, Chicago Czech continue to work on these issues, uh, continue to probably, you know, have some uh, disagreements and, um, and, and, and have some um, uh, 
maybe uh, yell that occasionally, uh, but uh, how can we continue to work together to uh, make Chicago and the greater Chicago area a better place for everyone, particularly those who have not received the best of care up to now? Yeah, thanks. I think, again, the power of data is enormous. So I'm really, you know, um, uh, when Keith talked about community health centers and vulnerable populations, you know, our populations are at risk from birth. I'm a pediatrician, right? Just because of where they're born, uh, just because of their economic environment, their community environment, all of those things. And um, therefore, you know, it's very powerful that we're able to collect detailed data uh, at the health center level and by the way, because of that broad view of health that health centers have, our data is very rich. We have data mm -hmm. elements on factors relating to social determinants and things like that that are normally absent from health records. And so by taking that data and being able to look at it at a population level, being able to track what happens as uh, our patients move through the system, we can shine a very, very bright light on health inequities and disparities in health journeys. And we're hopeful that by shining that light and making it obvious, it's gonna be harder for people to ignore it or to deny it. So that's mm -hmm. I think, um, the role that, uh, that we have to play. Thanks so much, Kamen. Would you like to add to that? Yes, uh, I think telling our stories is crucial to the message because out of those stories, we say, oh, I never thought about that from your academic or um, institutional perspective. Um, the other is putting value to that. Um, all of you who are the researchers and the academics, you studied hard, but you know what? We are living a life that experiences cancer, no matter which cancer it is. So we have to value that. And again, those ladies who spoke this morning, the men who were on yesterday, incredible stories. I was so touched and I have learned so much from my own community. Yeah, Carmen, I mean, that just makes you think like it, being able to come at it from both levels, right? Anyone that's done advocacy knows you need the big data to show what the big impact is, but then also those personal stories that bring it home. So our mm -hmm. ability through this collaboration to come at it from both ends, to link the very, very personal story to the big picture data and mm -hmm. outcomes, we can do incredible work. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, Keith, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to bring it back around to something that Carmen mentioned uh, and that's, you know, getting the information back to the community. And I think that um, our ability to collect data and even our ability to do research is, um, you know, there's, I don't think there's where the problem is. The problem is the questions we ask, which is important to get those questions from the community um, as, as was in this case, but also one of the things you said first, Carmen, when you first started to describe the experience was, um, what do we do when we have the results? And how do we communicate that back to the community? And I think as a researcher, I also struggle with that. Um, so even those who are on this, this call as community members, if there are ways that you think that would be um, best for us as researchers to get the word out, um, you know, uh, let us know. Because I, I, you know, you only hear stories when they catch on, you know? So if, if uh, the radio talks about it, or if it's on your news outlet, but uh, some of these very important issues are not gonna make it to that level. And we still have to figure out a way to discuss them because they are equally as important, but they may not have the same, um, you know, uh, your local newscaster may not want to discuss it. So uh, we have to figure out a way where we can bring those issues and keep them in the conversation and communicate better back to the community about what we've been able to uh, accomplish through our, our, our work. That, that's a great point, Keith. Thanks so much. And because as we in acad academia, we kind of look at, you know, peer reviewed journals and presentations and national places and stuff like that. But those are not, those are us just communicating with other researchers. Mm -hmm. 
to, to really communicate with the community, how do we do that? Kareem, perhaps you have a comment there? Yes, I, I, what I love is that Chicago Check has leaders shoulder to shoulder with community members. And for example, in your role as department head, I chair, I love the fact that you're able to incentivize your faculty. So if they, you know, when they do this work and they say, I wanna go out into the community and return and discuss in layperson's terms, what I found, mm -hmm. leadership that can support that. And that's one of the things I got from Chicago Check was that when Dr. Wynn was a cancer and director to Dr. Kitieski, I got the freedom to go out into the community and to report those results back. When I needed, you know, the cancer and director to join me because sometimes their message was more powerful as a leader, I got that. When I had Dr. John Stewart reporting to Black men about the importance of colorectal cancer screening in lay person's terms. We had a, a patient, I don't know if you remember this, Keith, but we had a citizen scientist on that call who picked up the phone and called his primary care doctor doing the, the training and told his primary care doctor, I'm age eligible for colorectal cancer screening because the guidelines have changed. His primary care doctor said, no, it hasn't. He said, yes, it has. I have two gastroenterologists <laughs> telling me this, one surgeon and one gastroenterologist, and he had polyps mm -hmm. and he was, wasn't 50. He was, you know, so what if he had waited? What if he didn't have that platform to speak to a Dr. Naylor, to speak to a Dr. Stewart, to have them speak to him in a language that allowed him to, to act upon it in real time? literally to get the screening that he needed. That, that's a great point, Kareem, because often there's so much a power differential between a patient and a physician and how to make that more equal, how to make sure that patients can, well, actually, you know, we thus should advocate for the patients, but we think we are, but we're not. <laughs> and so the patients actually do need to advocate for themselves sometimes. And as Fred said, how to provide that data so that the patients can advocate for themselves. And also how we, as you know, th those of us who are also physicians, but also in the universities can advocate for that. Plus making sure that we as physicians are more receptive to the patients and the community mm -hmm. about their true concerns to try to make it a real partnership rather than thinking that we are, but totally sucking at it. <laughs> but um, yes, um, thank you so much. And any other uh, comments at all? And again, um, I, I really think this uh, piece about not just getting the data, but making sure that the data works to better the health of the community. That's something that I uh, so much resonate with. And it's one of the big reasons I decided to uh, come to UIC because of the, I know that uh, of the social mission uh, that the institution has. And I think in Chicago check really reflects that. Um, but uh, any other, um, I think we're about four minutes, I, I think, uh, till, uh, till the end, but we still about four minutes. So um, especially from, you know, Carmen, Fred, um, any other um, thoughts that you would like to uh, contribute uh, regarding this collaboration, ongoing relationship? And perhaps Keith, uh, you have some comments as well. So I have one quick comment. I just wanted to say to the community, um, you know, I think COVID, uh, yeah. it exposed a lot of pre-existing weakness in, in, the, in the healthcare system. And those weaknesses don't necessarily go away because COVID's gone away. So I think about it like, um, you know, like a crack in your roof. It may not mm. be noticed unless it's raining. And COVID was that rain that made us all aware of how many cracks were in the system. Um, and it's, it's up to the community, I think, to stay on the healthcare system to make sure that those cracks are fixed because even as COVID starts to get better and the issues aren't as obvious for everyone, they still are most apparent to those that are, are living in that house with the crack. And many people never are able to, you know, they're always in that same house. They live in the community where those cracks are. So I think this is an opportunity for us to see those cracks and try to make sure they're fixed. But I think I would say to the community to hold us to the fire to make sure that we make sure that those cracks are fixed even when COVID isn't making it obvious that they're there. That's a great point. Thank you, Keith. And a comment, Fred? Um, any, other, any comments yeah, I, about I, that? Well, my, my last word is that um, we as community people should not be intimidated. Uh, I think the message from the uh, panel speakers, both the men and the women, is ask those questions, no matter of whom. Um, you know, and if you have a doubt, 
look for who can answer that doubt, who can help you. So I, I really believe that hearing those stories, determination is not to let go and take care of yourself and you be the leader. Don't anyone be the leader. You are. Governor, you know what? You always get me pumped every time I hear you speak. Great, thank you. We do have a, a, a question from a community uh, member. Um, so from the uh, Northeast uh, Illinois University live audience. Um, so how can we see this data and how can community organizations share with community and perhaps implement uh, implement programs? And I think implement programs is the key here. We have been discussing about how to share this data, um, but uh, perhaps uh, this um, uh, additional uh, step in how to implement uh, uh, you know, maybe in the last couple minutes we have, uh, if uh, any of the panel members can comment on that. Yes. You know, that's a fantastic question. I think there are a lot of efforts underway to uh, make data visible. Um, uh, so the health to, from the health department, uh, from Capricorn itself, I know we at Alliance are trying to make our data visible externally too. So that's a really great question. And I think Carmen, that's maybe something we should ponder next. Like, so you were able to ask the question you asked because you are familiar with what the data sources are and what's available. And so maybe uh, if we really want to stimulate questions from the community, we should be thinking through how can we make, you know, the data available use of data available to people so that we can start to generate those questions. I think it's a really, that's a great, uh, was a great Absolutely. coming from out there. And I think it gives us our next step. I think so. Great. Well, thank you so much. And Kareem, I know you put in the chat regarding how to democratize data, how to make it available to uh, everyone. And uh, I think uh, we're about to, uh, I think it's 1.15. And, and I have to say, as a moderator, this was uh, one of the easiest <laughs> moderating sessions I've had because you guys are also are great speakers and discussants. And thank you so much. I thought this was very vigorous, very exciting, very interactive. And I really appreciate uh, all of your contributions. Thank you so much. And also thank you to the audience for the, uh, for the uh, questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, and thank you so much once again to all of our panelists. Again, just like Dr. Jimbo said, this was the easiest um, session to probably moderate because we had such great speakers. They had awesome information for us. Um, and you all serve as such great resources to our community. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And um, right now it is, my, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Wynn for our closing remarks. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, this forum has to come to an end. And so uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Wynn to sign us out. Dr. Wynn, over to you. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like just to say humbly thank you. And it's like coming home for me. In fact, um, I really love hearing anytime I, I would, uh, when I was new to Chicago and I would hear about Carmen Velasquez and about how ultimately that would be an example of our North Star, they were in line. The reality is that I think what just got said in the last panel that I was able to join is this sense of grace and humility in academics, which sometimes is unfortunately hard to find. I'm gonna tell you just a little quick story about how all this came together, but there's a number of people to thank. You know, when I think about Dick Warnegie as we were actually putting this together and we just lost the giant. His framework of actually understanding how to put what we already knew into a framework and words so we can discuss it with academic folk was actually probably one of the best things and that I've learned from him. You know, it was once said, and the funny part about my grandfather, my grandfather once sort of said, boy, you don't need to go to school. He goes, all you going to school is to give it fancy titles. And he was right. Most of the education that I actually knew came from my neighborhood. Only thing I did when I went to college and everything else was be able to put a fancy title on it or talk about a conceptual framework. The conceptual framework we already were doing in the neighborhood. So what I loved about this program is that its inception came from a place of good. It came from a place where Northwestern, NEIU, and UIC, and 
I'm going to give him a shout out, even if he didn't want, so he can turn off the volume, Dr. Kareem Watson. <laughs> Without Dr. Watson, this grant doesn't move forward. Without Melissa Simon, this grant doesn't move forward. Without the early uh, champions at NEIU, this grant doesn't move forward. And by the way, without people like Rosemary Rogers, who was there right from the beginning, Joanne Glenn, Esther <laughs> Chiparella, Henrietta, you know, Barcelona, without those folk, this place and this space doesn't move. The growth is amazing because folks like Candace Henley and uh, the, you know, folks that are, are really kind of near and dear to my heart and new folks that have actually joined, like the folks that have put this thing together today, Melissa and others, I'm just so proud to just say that I was a part of being able to kick it off, whatever little part I play. I think it's important to give a shout out to folks, not only like Joanne and, and Sue Merlos and Judy and, 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 and others, but let's give a shout out to the people who carried the ball forward because sometimes we come up with these programs and I always sort of said it, Carmen, you may not remember this, but we were at one of a, I was on a party, we were at a party, we were doing something and essentially you said to me, and you may not remember that you said, well, it's good that you got something started, but you got to keep, how are you going to keep it going? I was like, oh, she's right. <laughs> and so for you, I will be forever grateful in going back to the shed and understanding that it wasn't enough just to get it. How could we continue it? And you all have done that with the work of Marion Fitzgibbons, Dr. Fitzgibbons, great shout out. Uh, I know Melissa Simons up there and Christina and uh, Lydia. I, I know you guys are all here. I hope all online. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And to the folks of Chicago and to the neighborhoods that I got to visit. I just want to say thank you for making me feel at home when I was there and making me feel that every time I touch Chicago, where this is the North, South, or West Side, I'm at home. And I want to thank you for that. I also want to point out just two quick things about this program. This program came together because we had the great idea of what would it be if we found the appropriate tone, grace, and humility of working with, not working, quote, for the community or doing things to the community, but working with the community, what great things could happen. Now, being academics, we tend to all of a sudden overthink some things and we tend to get excited about all these things and metrics. But I think it was Albert Einstein who said that not everything that can be counted counts. And not everything that counts can be counted. Now, the essence of this wonderful program that we have, and I'm going to close out, and I know Dr. You know, Dr. Watson's like, Look, don't let that boy, it, it, it ain't Sunday, but don't let that spirit move with me. You know, so I'm going to keep it short. I am going to keep it short. But I have to tell you that the mission has never changed. And with community members, the North Star never changes. And even sometimes when we come with some turbulence and we come with all these other things, the back and forth that sometimes happen in academics, the bean counting that needs to happen, the is the this, that, and that, and the other thing, and the protocol that needs to be filled, you all have a North Star. And when you think you get lost, all you have to do is reach out and touch the folks in the community. This was never a project and never a grant just about the glory of Northwestern or UIC and NEIU. I never would have been a part of that. The wonderful part about this is you don't know if I could jump through this screen and teleport myself back to Chi-Town, oh, I would, but I know I am where I am. Jeanette and many other people who were involved with, again, and, and people like uh, Jan Kadieski and others who are, and, and Leon Plantanius and others who are still there, I wanna just say thank you. I am not only just excited about what you are doing, but what you all are doing, and you may not know it, is becoming a model for many others who will point to this Chicago check. Now the Dr. Warnicke, I'm gonna throw up the Dr. W and say that I knew him and this program reflects him well. There is something that I do wanna say, quick message. WB Yates said it best, and you guys were talking about it on your last panel. But WB Yates is one of the greatest 
uh, writers that I know. And he said the following, think like the wisest of men and women, but communicate in the language of the people. And frequently, as we've learned through COVID, we talk at, around, and through, uh, because sometimes we feel like we are, are full of academic knowledge, but academic knowledge ain't sometimes real knowledge. I'm just letting y'all know. Your academic knowledge has limits too. In fact, we understood that more when people, we had the miracle drug called an mRNA vaccine, and that vaccine, 30% of the people said, I'm not taking it. Turns out that if people don't trust you, they don't really care how much you know. What's that? Teddy Roosevelt said, no one cares how much you know until they know what? Until they know that you care. This program has an opportunity to merge that, which is the academic intellectual curiosity that is consistent with who we are as human beings without forgetting our humanity. And it's the marriage of that academic curiosity of building knowledge and professing knowledge and brewing new science and bringing new innovative models of navigation integrated within our humanity that makes this Chicago check and now this Dick Warnegie sort of program special. Now I've been told to keep it short. That's look, that look, that's what they you look, I I, I know what happens when I get the hook. Um, but I'm gonna wrap things up and just say that I am not only with you, but there's never a day that Chicago is not far from my heart and never a day that even in Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, there's walking now with a little bit of West and South side of Chicago and North side of Chicago every day. As a result of that, we actually are starting to understand that it's not enough to be smart, that there is science, and there's a lot of interesting things to be done in how one communicates. It too is a science. No longer are the days that just because you walk around with some pipette or a white lab coat, you're the smartest person on the block. You can be the smartest person in, in your lab, but you come on out in my hood and I, I could tell you quick, fast, and hurry. There's a whole lot you ain't gonna know. So let's have the understanding and the humility on all sides that even in the community, that there are people who are working hard, who actually in the last 50 years have figured out how to do a better job against breast cancer. So that now that we have people, women with advanced breast cancer, men with advanced breast cancer, that's no longer a death sentence. In my lifetime, I had a front row seat and being able to show that people who really do care through their science are able to have people with lung cancer only not have just one single choice but to ultimately have now choices of immunotherapy and all this is that are life not only saving and not only, you know, but life providing and the ability to not only just survive cancer, but to thrive even when you have it. There is no, as I have a something on Friday here called facts and faith, and I told everybody that your facts are not at war with your faith, and neither is science at war with our humanity. Is these artificial things that we put there. This program, if there's any wish and any prayer that I have, leads the country in understanding of how the integration of science and humanity and the integration of grace and humility on all sides can bring about new, new approaches that save lives and that makes people well. And by the way, that understands that just because you've given me a drug and you cut out the cancer, you give me a drug to treat my cancer, it ain't all done. That is not being whole. So I wish you all well, and I wish I could be with you. And at some point, I hope y'all okay with me enough to know that I want to come back. And if there's another party or something like that, I would love to come back and just be among you just one more time. I love UIC. I love working with NEIU and Northwestern. But importantly, I love you all. Chicago was a place that I not only found myself and grew as an individual, but grew to understand the courage, as Carmen Velasquez would say, that you have to find your voice in the, in the, and find the courage to represent. And in fact, 
the many people without uh, with Miles Square and many of the other FQHCs and many people throughout the city and the state that ultimately got me to understand that, you know what, if I don't say nothing, ain't nothing gonna happen. The truth of the matter is courage means risk. There is no courageous act without risk. That's why if you see a baby carriage coming down the street like they did in old movies, you would have to have someone jumping out in front of the bus. It's courageous because you didn't really know the outcome, but you knew what you had to do. We know what we have to do. And I could find no more people in the country better than I know that will lead the way. So all I can say is I know I'm wrapping up and I just want to say I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. I really do wish I could be. I miss, look, I miss some of the foods and all that stuff, but look, I'm going to leave it alone because, you know, again, I got to say Richmond's good. They do got some Southern food here and all the rest. And that's good too, but it ain't Chicago. So if there's anything I can ever do to lift you up, but hopefully I will need your prayers to lift me up in this mission we have of bringing science closer to our communities so that it might do more good. And lastly, maybe we can finally have a conversation that many of you have been trying to have about not only building, having academic centers build trust, but what about their own institutional trustworthiness? How come it's the community that has to, quote, believe in you as opposed to institutions demonstrating? And by the way, when you talk about trustworthiness, I've read it up in Webster. I did. Dr. Dr. Watson know I do things like that. I looked it up when I don't know. I looked it up in Webster. Trust means to have faith in. Trustworthiness means to demonstrate. And if we're talking about demonstrating, it's now time for all of our academic institutions to put a mirror to themselves and see how are we building institutional trustworthiness so that when we approach the community, we're approaching them with a right mind, with not only right intent, but with the right track record. I hope this program sets that into motion. I just wanna say thank you. I love love, I love y'all like y'all don't even know. And some of y'all, I mean, I know I was probably a pest. And you know, I know occasionally I'd be around some places and they'd be like, who is this boy? I'd be like, I know, I'm just asking, I'm just always excited. It is true, I am always excited. And I did stay off the coffee today because I was told that I had to do this. So, you know, I'm just going to uh, say thank you. Um, thank you for all the people who actually made this possible. Thank you for those early pioneers. And thank you for the community on taking a risk on us that this program would grow into something and letting it not only the seed be planted, but the consistent watering of it so that it might grow. And me may not be perfect yet, but every day we wake up there's an opportunity to make it better. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I know I'm supposed to be done because they're just checking me out right now. I just got the text. So I'm, so thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Dr. Wren. I mean, that was, I mean, round of applause, you know. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone, um, for to all of our speakers, to all of our participants, to all of our panelists from yesterday and today. I mean, you all are such an inspiration. I was a Chicago Tech Fellow in 2020. And from then, I mean, my the fire has definitely been lit and it's definitely burning strong. And just seeing the work that you all continue to do just continues to be a motivation to persist through these educational um, barriers right now so we can get to that point where we can continue to do the work just like you. So. Thank you so much for continuing to be an inspiration and planting that seed, you know. Um, it's like you said, where the sustainability of these programs is critical to their success. So people don't just fall off to the wayside. So thank you so much for the work that you did. Thank you so much for continuing to serve as an inspiration. And thank you so much to everyone for attending this forum. Um, I'm glad to see all of the questions, to see that people do participate in these things. And this is what we need. We need to bring our community into the system because we cannot keep pushing people to the outside and having them just be outliers. So thank you so much, everyone. Again, I can't even say thank you enough. Um, this was just, this was honestly amazing. The entire time I've just been sitting here, just being inspired. I mean, I'm currently writing essays for a PhD application right now. And I'm just like, wow, I need to write that down. I need to write that down because 
these are the things that just continue to just inspire you and you just say yes these things are possible you know um i feel like just as a single person it may seem like the problem is too big and it's too impossible but um i know seeing professionals like you all they continue to inspire us that yes these things are possible through collaboration and through healthy communication with our community so thank you so much again with everyone and this was just amazing i mean the energy in this meeting is just so positive and I just absolutely cannot say thank you enough. Um, I know we're three minutes over time, so I'm going to let everyone go. Um, but again, thank you everyone and enjoy your weekend. Bye everyone.